address before the coffee break. The two next speakers are Ms. Mariniki Alevezopoulou and Mr. Augustino Zenakos from Unfollow Magazine in Greece. Unfollow Magazine is an independent magazine, publishes investigative journalism, political and cultural an analysis. Unfollow Magazine was one of the uh, news and political analysis outlets which were created during uh, the Greek financial, social, and humanitarian crisis as an effort to provide alternative and uh, original uh, in, uh, news to the people. And its publications have been discussed frequently in the Greek public sphere, as well as in the Greek parliament, because of the content of uh, the publications, which often uh, include uh, publications of uh, scandals uh, of the Greek government. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marinika Levozopoulou and Augustino Zenakos. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, as uh, Dimitri said in his very kind introduction, we are journalists, so that's what we're going to talk to you about. Um, but it's not going to be um, simply a, a brief, uh, let's say, anthology of, of stories we're, we've done. We'll try to make a point through um, presenting elements of these stories. And the point we'll try to make is that, uh, starting from the, the principle that journalism has a, uh, an obligation to uh, scrutinize power and authority, in Greece at the moment, um, what is going on is um, severely debilitating in terms of, of having independent reporting. Um, having said that, uh, also a, a key thing that we're going to try and uh, communicate to you is that although there's a lot of discussion about Greece in, in Europe, uh, most of this discussion is unfortunately uh, framed by uh, national governments uh, the Greek government included, concerns our financial troubles and is mostly about whether we're going to meet one target or another, um, whether we have a surplus uh, in our budget or not, uh, whether we're going to need another bailout. bailout. Um, who is it who's paying for this? Is it the European taxpayers? How are we going to pay it back, etc.? What's almost never discussed is the fact that these last four years in Greece have signified an erosion of democratic liberties and a tightening of state authority and brutality never before experienced in the last decades in a European country. And what's also uh, very strange is that the whole discussion about Europe and the European project um, is not really a discussion about whether the Eurozone is going to stay intact or whether the Euro is a, is a good idea, as actually the discussion is being, is being conducted at the moment. It should be more about what Europe was supposed to have been organized around, a, a set of values, as uh, one of our introductory uh, speakers mentioned. But although Greece at the moment is facing this erosion of democratic liberties that we're going to talk to you about a lot more. We do not see Europe, at least on a central level, addressing these issues at all. So in a, in a way, it's very fortunate that we are following the uh, presentation of Ms. Phillips from The Guardian, because I was wondering whether our esteemed uh, 
Minister of Public Order ever um, came to suing the Guardian as he threatened in the Greek Parliament. Our information says he has not. What happened there? Why did uh, our Minister of Public Order, Mr. Dendias, threaten to sue the Guardian? The problem, his big problem, let me show you a picture. Yeah, is this it? So the issue was this. This is an anti-fascist Greek protester. Sorry. I don't want it on automatic. Okay. Is this OK? Um, this guy was arrested during an anti-fascist demonstration. He was being beaten up all night by the police while handcuffed in a chair. The Guardian, uh, a reporter for The Guardian, Maria Margaronis, uh, did a story on this, interviewed the victim, spoke with the lawyers. The Minister of Public Order denied in Parliament it ever took place and threatened to sue the newspaper. So that's, that's the issue. A couple of weeks Later, another thing happened. The police arrested some bank robbers that were also self-confessed anarchists. A day after the arrest, they released their pictures. Oh, by the way, this is another anti-fascist protester. This is a taser gun mark, police taser gun mark. They released their pictures. These were the pictures. and. Uh, then a lot of us, a lot of journalists, complained that uh, these pictures had been obviously photoshopped uh, and rather crudely. So in response to that, the police then released the pictures without the Photoshop alterations. And this is an example. They again were brutally tortured after having been arrested. Now these people haven't been convicted of anything now, the, the Greek police tortures people all the time, as a matter of course. Occasionally, some of them reach the European Courts of Human Rights. There have been 12 convictions of the Greek police in the last decade for torturing people, um, mostly demonstrators and immigrants. <coughs> When this happened, the Minister of Public Order was questioned, why did you Photoshop their faces, their, their photographs? And he replied, because they had to be recognizable. So what we did in Unfollow Magazine, in our following issue, is we did this cover. This is the Prime Minister of Greece. <laughs> and it reads, Photoshopped Prime Minister, politics must be recognizable. <laughs> well, it took a couple of days. Then, all of a sudden, members of parliament and ministers were on the morning news shows waving the cover around and demanding that a prosecutor take action. Here you see Mr. Michelogianakis, Michelakis, excuse me, who is now Minister of uh, the Interior holding up the cover on TV. They were accusing us of inciting terrorism. In fact, they were accusing Syriza, the left-wing main op opposition party, of inciting terrorism, saying that 
If a magazine is aggressively critical towards government practices, then it must be an instrument of the opposition. Then we received a phone call from a source that our cover was on the desk of the prosecutor of the Supreme Court. He, according to the information, had received it from the Prime Minister's press office with the directive to do something about it. We were told by our source to get out of the office. On the next day, a different source confirmed the information. According to this second source, the file with our cover had worked its way down to the prosecutor of the court of first instance, who would be the, the one to take action. We were to be prosecuted according to a law on committing offense to the polity of the country. But our source said the true agenda was to attack to the main opposition party, again, without explaining the connection between them and us, by associating them with violence and terrorism. In the end, we were saved by Cyprus. That weekend, the big crisis with Cypriot banks broke, and the focus on the news and the government press office in Greece shifted completely. Nothing happened, unlike for Cyprus, like for us. As you might know, Greece recently dropped to a rank 99 in the Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index. What does this mean? How is it possible that a country with a, le a legitimate, democratically elected government has such a dreadful press freedom record? So, a lot of the time when we talk about press freedom, what we mainly mean is some sort of censorship, some sort of preemptive controls on what the press can or cannot say. But in the case of Greece, this is very different. And it's again very strange how this is very rarely addressed on a central European level. In Greece, there is no censorship as such. What there is, oh, well, rarely there has been, but I mean, this is not the main way to, to describe the, the issue. The main way to describe the issue is that there is a system in which there's a pact between politicians, business interests, the judiciary, and the mainstream media. Now, this system is impenetrable. And part of the reason why the media are willing participants in this, um, and perhaps if you're not very familiar with the Greek media landscape, you, do not, you don't know this, is that the Greek media for a very long time now are very unsuccessful businesses. They're heavily in debt. But they don't, they're not independent, they're not standalone businesses. They, their large majority belong to people that have very identifiable, <coughs> different interests that are connected with the state. For example, um, they own construction companies that take contracts from the state to build roads and bridges and public works. Or they are shipping uh, magnates that depend on particular tax exemptions for their activities, etc., etc. Now, why did those unsuccessful businesses manage to survive for so long? Because they were given loans, loans without guarantees, easy to get loans, usually from two banks, the National Bank of Greece and the Agricultural Bank of Greece, in both the state was a major shareholder up to a point. They were more easily influenced by politicians. Now, it was those loans that helped 
keep these businesses up. The money was made from other business, not from the media. The media was just there for pressure. Now, when the crisis came, and part of it meant that these loans were more heavily scrutinized, those media immediately started giving out the government line almost to a T. I mean, they never ever deviate from what the government line is. It doesn't matter if they are traditionally right-leaning or left-leaning. They might use a slightly different language, but the line will be the same. Just to give an example, this is, uh, let's say, not, 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 not an issue of what to do with the debt or, or something like that. It's, it's a social issue. So in a sense, uh, the media should have been even freer to deviate from the main line. Running up to the elections of 2012, we, we spoke a little bit about this at the screening that was organized yesterday uh, about the documentary film Ruins. Running up to the um, uh, election of 2012, uh, what the police did was sweep the streets and arrest hundreds of women. Uh, and then these women were forcibly tested for HIV and the judicial authorities gave their consent for their private data and their photographs to be published on the police website. And the Ministry of Health, the Minister of Health at the time came out and started saying that they were a health bomb threatening the Greek family. Um, Andreas Loverdos is his name, yes. And the Minister of Public Order uh, concluded. So basically these women, they were accused of purposefully infecting people with HIV uh, because of being prostitutes. In fact, they weren't. None of them were prostitutes. They were drug addicts picked up off the street. They were paraded all over the internet because of the media. Now, what's really interesting, we've blurred their faces, but the faces were completely visible, actually, uh, all over the internet. Now, what's really interesting about this is that the vast majority of the Greek media, in fact, every single mainstream newspaper or TV station, reproduced these photographs and the government line about them being a health bomb at the heart of the Greek family without ever asking, is it true? I mean, it, it is what the Ministry of Health saying, is, is it true? Are they, in fact, criminals? Did they purposefully infect anybody at all? Has anybody ever come forward? In fact, nobody ever come forward, came forward. Are they prostitutes? Are they, who are they? Should I do this? What's the HIV profile in Greece? What's the truth? They published them without ever checking a single fact. Now, this will give you an idea about how the Greek media are functioning in the crisis. So, nobody should really think in terms of censorship. They should rather think in terms of an impenetrable pact. And I'm sorry if this sounds strange to you. I have no other way of describing it. But I can tell you that journalists that deviate from this line of treating information and this line of uh, addressing to the public are faced with very strange measures indeed. One of our colleagues named Poppy Christodoulidou, um, scarcely a, a week ago, 10 days ago, published a story on, on a blog that said that she was asked by a source in the um, Coast Guard um, if it was legal that the Coast Guard special forces were being used to guard sensitive targets in the center of Athens. And she replied uh, that it was. In the summer, a law was passed that effectively 
under certain circumstances, put the Coast Guard Special Forces under the direction of the police. And uh, she actually published uh, what we call the newspaper of the government. It's basically an official government publication where every single law has to be published in order for it to take effect. So what she did was publish this absolutely public record. She was called into this department for protecting the polity of the country. She was interrogated uh, with her lawyer for five of or six hours, accused that she published a classified military document. Of course, she did no such thing. <laughs> and then she was threatened that unless she takes the post down, then her prosecution is going to go ahead. She refused. She is asking for support. Some of us are trying to support her. This issue is still um, open. And now, our story. On January 31st, 2013, the 14th issue of Unfollow magazine hit the newsstands all over Greece. Among other reports, we published one on oil smuggling in Greece specifically the, the practice of oil career companies to buy oil at reduced tax rates and channel it back into the market at the normal price. We also published two reports by the 7th Piraeus Customs Authority with detailed findings on how two major oil companies engage in this practice. One is LP, Hellenic Petroleum, where the principal shareholders are the Greek state and Spiros Latsis. The other is a Gian Oil, which is run by Dimitris Melisanidis, although without an official position, though his brother, Iakovos Melisanidis, holds a post on the board. The Aegean group of companies is truly colossal. Among other things, it supply yes. Excuse me. Here is Mr. Melisanidis with our Prime Minister, Mr. Andoni Samaras. They are friends. Well, among other things, Mr. Melisanidis, his company, it supplies the American Navy and one of its associated companies trades in the New York Stock Exchange. At the same time, Dimitris Melisanidis was um, a contender to Biopap, the state company that holds a monopoly on, on gambling. Some months later, he actually did, did buy it. On the day following the publication of Unfollow, it was the 1st of February, there was a phone call to the office of Unfollow. The caller asked for reporter Lefteris Haralambopoulos, who was written the, the report, and identified his, himself as Dimitris Melisanidis. Our reporter talked to the caller on speaker, with Augustine and myself also present. The man, self-identified as Dimitris Melisanidis, threatened the magazine with legal action, and our reporter replied that he should, of course, proceed as he sees fit. Following that, the caller threatened our reporter's life repeatedly. Of the 20 minutes phone call, about 10 minutes were spent on threats to our reporter, Lefteris Haralambopoulos. Part of what said by the man self-identified as Dimitris Melisanidis which was taken down by our reporter, follows. I could have you killed without having warned you, but I'm a man, and I'm gonna have you blown up in your sleep. I'll have you kill you, your wife, your children, everything you've got. 
When our reporter told the caller that he would alert the authorities, he replied, screw you and the authorities. I don't understand anything. I am Melisanidis. You will not be able to sleep. You will not be able to go out. I'll be your nightmare. They will come to your house and blow you up in your sleep. I'm used to talking to big journalists. When our reporter asked if by big journalists the caller meant those who play his game, the caller replied, I want you to tell me that with a gun to your head. As you see in the photograph, Mariniki mentioned before, this is a good friend of our Prime Minister, um, but also his lawyer who called us up the next day, one of his lawyers, um, is a member of the political committee of the ruling party. Now these, these threats reached the Greek parliament uh, that were mentioned uh, during a parliamentary question on oil smuggling and they were given a reply by the uh, spokesman for the ruling party, New Democracy. This uh, is Makis Boridis, who is well known for having uh, served in a fascist party in the past, but he is now um, in the ruling right-wing party. Um, so what he said was, uh, why should Parliament be concerned with this? Uh, this is a difference between two private individuals. Who do we care whose lawyer, uh, which lawyer uh, Mr. Melisanidis has? Now, the fact that Mr. Melisanidis was at the time poised to buy uh, what was a big, big uh, asset in the Greek privatization program that is being imposed as part of the um, bailout uh, program, um, and the fact that his lawyer um, is a member of the ruling party, in fact, uh, a member of the political committee, um, clearly wasn't a political issue uh, for the government spokesman. It was uh, just um, a private matter. Um, now, what he, what Mr. Melisanidis also did was sue us in civil court, of course. Uh, we filed a criminal suit against him for the threats. He sued us in, in civil court. Uh, he's asking for half a million. Um, actually, before we came here, uh, yesterday morning was our last court date, so now we're waiting for the decision, which will take maybe two or three months. Of course, for an independent magazine, uh, such a lawsuit is a make or break thing. But um, what should be mentioned more, more generally is that um, lawsuits such as this are very often used in, in Greece and they're used very, very liberally. And this is, this is precisely the idea that anyone that deviates from this main line will be so hard hit that nobody will think about uh, doing it again. Now what's interesting is that um, we've done many stories like this and um, at one point uh, where we can't connect it to this particular story but at one point um, this is interesting also in the wider context of this conference we started realizing that something was very wrong with our phones. Um, we started looking into it and uh, one very worrying part was that we've done a story about the so-called truth team. Now, very briefly, the truth team is a name for an unofficial group within New Democracy, the, the ruling party in Greece. What they do, uh, what they did before the elections, is basically propaganda. What they do is research other parties and find out uh, uh, ways uh, to um, you know, face their arguments or discredit them or, or whatever. Um, this before the election is probably an interesting issue to discuss. After the election, when these guys, some of these guys actually got uh, official positions 
uh, in the government or around the prime minister um, is uh, a different matter altogether. <coughs> and uh, this is our prime minister there on your left. Next to him is the director of his press office, the prime ministerial press office. Next to him is a guy that is concerned with the New Democracy Party's uh, technical issues. He's a computer guy. And next to him is a former, um, in, during the election campaign, was one of the directors of the election campaign, but has since been appointed director of the Greek intelligence service. Now, of course, as you understand, a, a propaganda team that is suddenly um, promoted uh, to handling the official communication of a government that has such overt ties to someone that is now directing the Greek intelligence service is a very worrying thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, and um, we started looking into, into this a little bit. Um, we talked to some uh, former um, intel intelligence uh, officers, also a former uh, director. This current director's name is uh, Thodoris Dravilas. Um, and we started uh, piecing together a story. We're going to finish with this. Piecing together a story about what the Greek intelligence community is up to at the moment. And of course, I'm not going to repeat everybody knows here what the capabilities of an intelligence service can be at the moment, and there are uh, people that know the, the technical side of it a lot better. But what happens in Greece, which is an added worry, is that a lot of people start selling these capabilities, these services, on the private market. Now, it's not just that the state has all this capacity of intruding into your life, is that a private individual, uh, a business person with particular interests, can actually hire these capabilities. The equipment is freely available on the open market, but they can also hire experts, and they can use that against anybody who's being, let's say, too annoying. Uh, as part of a story, uh, we also realized that one of the former uh, chief operations officers, that is the guy directly under this guy, is now incidentally working for Mr. Melissanidis, with, with whom we have this uh, ongoing um, disagreement. So I think that's it for us from the moment. For the moment, thank you very much. Thank you.